All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the August 19, 2020 town hall meeting. Um, I want to begin by telling everyone that the village is doing great. Um, our village team has been very vigilant in terms of public safety at all levels, uh, and we are very happy with our collaboration with the Yellow Springs Community Foundation, uh, the Chamber of Commerce and all the other nonprofits that have come together to fill those gaps and make sure that everyone is staying safe and that we're responding to uh, the needs of our community members. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our village manager, Josue Salmaran, uh, to update you on the numbers and some of the other things going on in the village. Thank you, Brian. Um, thank you for joining us for another virtual town hall. Uh, we have, I think, really good messaging and uh, a good ideas, a good proposal of ideas and projects that we want uh, we want to make you aware of and get your feedback. Uh, but before I go there, I want to talk about our cases. Today in Ohio, we're at 110,881 cases. With 821 cases in the county, our numbers here in, in the village, we are now at one active case. Uh, so that's good. We were at two for a while. We're now at one. And I'm hopeful that we'll get to zero like we were at the beginning of July and we'll stay on, on zero. Uh, we, we, we've done a great job so far. So that's on the numbers. I want to talk a little bit about our CARES funds and how we've used our funds. So I'm going to share my screen. And this is, this is a presentation I gave to council. So if you're seeing it again, um, apologize for the duplicate information, but I think it's important information for us to continue to talk about because there are things that we're planning in the near future that we want your input on. So I'm going to share my screen now. And all right, you should see a slide. Okay. As, as you may know, we received $130,217.54 uh, from the state uh, through the CARES Act. These are CARES Act funds. We've also been awarded 12,000 from the Ohio Office on Criminal Justice Services for COVID-19 related uh, services. Right below that is our expenses. Our non-personnel expenses have totaled $53,634.71. We've had personnel expense uh, to the tune of $103,375. Of that $103,000, there are a little over $21,000 in personnel expenses that cannot be allocated uh, anywhere else in our budget. The distinction here is that that $103,000 in personnel expenses, um, many of it has come from areas in our organization where we had a budget uh, for employees and we incurred an additional personal expense because we had to send uh, employees home during the month of March, April, and May when we went into a shutdown and we had personnel working two or three days um, in the rotation shift because we wanted to minimize the time of interaction among employees. So if there was a potential spread, we wanted to be able a uh, spread of a coronavirus, we wanted to be able to isolate it to uh, different teams so that we could ensure the continuity of essential services to you. So that's water, electricity, sewer service, all the essential services that you rely on. Um, if any of our employees were sick, uh, we still had a backup team to be able to continue to provide those services. So we had some of those salary expenses were already um, included or contemplated in, in the personnel expense of those uh, departments. All right, where have we spent our money? This is a breakdown of non-personnel expenses. Of the $53,634, we have provided about 32% of the funds in business support, which is $17,104. 20% has gone to community outreach efforts. 26.5% has gone to community support and 21% to, towards government operations. So I think this is a good balance of the distribution of funds on how our community has expressed us supporting, supporting all of our stakeholders and how council 
express the continued support from the administration um, to our community, uh, to our business uh, community, and, um, and the broader community at large, this piece is in the community outreach, which is the marketing uh, activities that we've done to ensure that our visitors understand the expectations here in the community. And we're encouraging the, the masses. So good distribution, how we spent our funds. What is ahead? Uh, in our last council meeting, I presented um, this uh, strategy or vision on the use of the funds. And we want to focus on high and long-term impact for all stakeholders. So what specifically could we do to support um, that goal? And we're looking at three things. A wireless mesh, which is a, a public Wi-Fi system. This would be high impact. It helps build business community and infrastructure resilience. Particularly important as we'll see the, our, our school system continue online education services. Uh, we want our community uh, and our school children to have access to the internet, a good reliable internet. And I think it will help business and the broader community. The second uh, proposal or second activity is school support at the John Bryan Center. Um, we wanna create a safe and conducive environment that would uh, be engaging and encourage uh, our school children to be engaged in their online activities through school. So the proposal will be to do some modification to our, our youth center at the John Bryan to create workstations that our students, some of our most vulnerable students, could sign up for time slots or blocks of time at the center so that they're able to uh, connect with their school and take their online courses. We would also staff the center with an aid that could help, that could assist with instructions that the student may, may struggle with following um, or any other assistance to the student. Now, it's not going to be child care, it's not going to be daycare, and there may be limited tutoring because we want to create the space, we want to help students get connected and follow along. Um, so that would be the, the, the primary focus there, to create a safe uh, and welcoming space for our most vulnerable school children. The third project on here is ongoing support. The administration and council made a commitment to continue to support our residents and business community with resources to and help us get through this. And those resources being hand sanitizer uh, signs and other supportive services uh, during this uh, pandemic. So. We're proposing to continue that, and we estimate um, around twenty thousand uh, dollars from when we ran the report on non-personal expenses uh, through uh, September. So those are my three uh, ideas. So uh, please um, reach out to me if you have any any um, suggestions, recommendations, or any general feedback. You can uh, post a comment on the on Facebook and YouTube, or you can email me directly or email um, uh, Philip, and he'll make sure to get us the, your comments. All right. <coughs> Joining us tonight is uh, Fire Chief Colin Altman. Um, so, Chief. Thank you, Josue. Ladies and gentlemen, Miami Township Fire Chief Colin Altman coming to you live tonight from the world-famous Ponds Institute. Uh, I am here with uh, noted medical experts, Dr. Stephen Fauci, Dr. Anthony Fauci's lesser known brother, Dr. Deborah Burks, Dr. Dino Pallotta, Dr. Karen Wintrow, Doc from the Love Boat, and of course, Luke Dennis, WYSO General Manager. Um, as Josue said, our numbers in Ohio are up about 101,000 or so. Um, We've been three days now in Ohio where the increase has been under 1,000 cases per day, which is a good thing, uh, except that the number is slowly tricking back up again. Um, as Josue said, here in Yellow Springs, uh, we're down to, within the village, we're down to one case. Uh, in the township, we're at one case as well, both in the 45387 zip code. Um, and those are, uh, you know, feel good numbers that make us feel good about ourselves. However, we have to remember that there's a lot of things we just can't do to control the virus, unfortunately. 
So we shouldn't really feel bad about ourselves if suddenly there's three or four cases in the village. Um, as we move forward into the fall, uh, it's going to become even more important for us to continue the steps that we've done. Uh, wear your mask, social distance, wash and sanitize your hands, and stay home if you don't feel well. Uh, stay home if you're in a vulnerable population. I know it's not fun, but we need to do that. Um, as we look at schools reopening, both college and elementary and secondary, <clears throat> we have to keep in mind a couple things. Um, the greatest increase in cases and age range right now are the younger, younger ages under 25 years old across the country. Um, and whereas some uh, noted health experts like Donald Trump have said that children can't get and spread the virus, um, this is not backed up by, uh, by even docs in the love boat. Um, the children can get the virus. They typically don't get it as severely as uh, older and other vulnerable populations, but they can. Uh, so it's important that if you are sending your kids to school, uh, obviously if you're not in the Yellow Springs district, but if you're sending your kids off to school, private school, parochial, you make sure that they're wearing a mask. You make sure that they know about social distancing um, because it's important to protect not just the, your, your children, but also yourself from them, uh, grandma and grandpa, Mrs. McGreedy, Sister Helen, all those people who might be teaching them. Um, it's going to be an interesting challenge to see how college is open. Um, already we're seeing a lot of rollback going there. So we'll see what our big ones do around here, uh, UD and Wright State, um, and see how all that goes. So we have to just keep going because the big issue that we're looking at in the fall is the possibility of a second wave of coronavirus, but also the onslaught of the flu season. Uh, most ex experts are expecting a pretty significant uh, flu season. Uh, so we really urge everybody here on behalf of myself and the people here at the Ponds Institute and the Fauci brothers and Dino, get your flu shot. If you saw something on Facebook that tells you that, you know, vaccines are bad, it's not true. It's not true, it's 2020 people. Stop believing what you see on social media or what your friend Linda told you or your friend Jim, whoever. Get your flu vaccine. It's gonna be critically important this season particularly. Um, there's the possibility we're gonna look at mass immunization clinics so we really can keep people healthy. I might be giving you your flu shot. So good God, you wanna get that at your physician's office before you come to me. Watch out people. Osway knows, he knows how it is. We're also looking into the future at the possibility of when the COVID uh, vaccines are available. And you've all seen the numbers. Only about 40% of Americans are saying that they, they would take the, the vaccine. Um, we gotta get that number up. Um, otherwise, this thing is gonna linger and linger and linger. It's gonna be like a cranberry song. So we need to do the right thing. Get our vaccines, wash our hands and everything else. Wear our face mask socially distance or physically distance, whatever term you like, just get it done, do it. If you don't have a mask, come see me at the fire department. Talk to Brian Housh, I'm sure he still has a few left over here and there. Uh, we'll get you a mask. You can buy them at stores now, everything's available. You can go to Kroger and buy hand sanitizer. There's no more excuses. Get it done people and don't have a big party either because those are bad. Um, fire department. One of the questions that I get from the fire department or for the fire department is, when are we moving into that big fire station? We're hoping sometime in October. So watch the skies. We're going to have a huge blowout like they just had in Wuhan, China. Really, they did. Um, we're going to have a very conservative, socially distant, ribbon-cutting type ceremony in which you'll all be wearing masks and have your temperatures taken uh, prior to coming into our new building. But we want you to see what your tax dollars are building. Uh, it's a fantastic facility that is going to last 40, 50 years uh, for the township and the village and all our other areas that we serve. Um, and I'll let our guys stay healthy. We're actually putting in a, uh, with CARES Act funds that the township received, uh, an air filtration system that will help keep uh, the air that we breathe, obviously the air that we breathe, the air that we breathe <laughs> safe, um, from coronavirus and other horrible things that might affect us. So, what was I talking about? Right, things like that. So anyway, that's it. Wear your mask, social distance, wash and sanitize your hands. Come see us sometime in October at our new home. 
Um, we'll have a, a very uh, less than exciting party, but it'll be fun. Um, and that's it. If you need us, give us a call. Otherwise, back to you, Josue, or Brian, or whoever's in charge today. <laughs> Chief, thank you. I can't wait for the ribbon cutting ceremony. I'll be there. Well, uh, in full you will. We've already booked you. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. You're the entertainment. <laughs> Oh, it's going to be a short party then. It's going to be a short, <laughs> short event. All right. Joining me, joining us tonight is Florence Randolph. Uh, Florence, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Josue. I'd like to say um, we have increased the um, number of people who are receiving services for um, their rent or um, housing assistance. So if you're in need of help with your rent or your utilities, there are funds available from the CARES Act and there's fun, there are funds available from a grant from our Yellow Springs Community Foundation, Home Inc. And we're working in collaboration with the um, Yellow Springs credit union so that your bills can be paid. We don't want anyone to be out on the street, especially now that winter's coming. So if you're in need of food, utilities, or rent assistance, please contact me at 937-767-3716. Thank you. Thank Back you so much, Florence. Thank you. All right. Also joining us is Mayor Pam. Welcome, Mayor. Thank you, Josue. It's good to be here as usual. I have a couple of announcements tonight, and they're in, intertwined. But it's something I'm starting to speak about tonight, and I'll be speaking about, I'm sure, again. First announcement, as most of you know, if you're watching this show, women received the right to vote 100 years ago yesterday with the final approval for the passage of the, the 19th Amendment. And I thought thus it was only fitting tonight to do a couple of things to, first of all, Philip, if you could throw up that first slide, I'm going to put on my sash put on my sash colored purple, white, and yellow, the sash worn by the suffragettes, not this actual one, but the suffragists wore purple, yellow, and white sashes to represent loyalty, purity, and life. So I thought it only a fitting that I wear this. If there's any kindergartners out there watching, they know exactly what this is. So what I wanna do now is talk, and I wanna refer you to the picture that Philip just put up there. I got this one out of uh, Dayton Daily News. It's a group of suffragettes. I was going after some folks from Antioch, but you know, sorry, Colin, those wacky Antiochians. Uh, Scott Sanders is still working on that, so maybe there is hope for a photograph of our some of our local folk. But these are some suffragettes out of Dayton. That's me right there in the middle with my glasses on, see? So at any rate, uh, that was a lot of fun looking at pictures yesterday. There were many out there celebrating the 100 year anniversary of women getting the right to vote. And on one of my recent strolls around in the village, Mayor Pam, you're on. Very good. I'm going to take this from the top because I want to remind everyone that yesterday was a very important anniversary. Women received the right to vote 100 years ago yesterday. And that's why I'm wearing my sash, the three colors being purple, white, and yellow. And yes, those are very intentional because they stand for loyalty, purity, and the yellow energy of life. Think uh, sunflowers out in the field at Tecumseh Land Trust. So thinking about the anniversary of the 19th Amendment got me thinking about voting. And so I'm going from my sisters here, the uh, suffragist sisters from the University of Dayton to the sign that I saw downtown in the village 
the last couple of days as I've been walking. It's a very good reminder about some of our voting information that we need to keep in mind as we get closer and closer to the general election on November 3rd. So back, you know, back in the day, you used to have a special reason for voting absentee. And as of January 27th in 2006, you no longer needed a special reason, but rather you could just vote absentee if you wanted to vote absentee. But what that means is you have to request an absentee ballot. And then in turn, once that is properly received, your regular ballot on which you're going to vote will be sent to you. And as this poster up here shows us, there are certain timelines we have to be really aware of now, especially with some of the issues going on with the United States Post Office. All of the information I'm about to summarize for you can be found at the local Greene County Board of Election. But just to sort of highlight for you, your absentee voter request must be mailed or dropped off in person to the safe and secure box outside the voting uh, station on um, Ledbetter Road, the Bureau, the Green County Board of Elections. So that ballot drop-off box will be available 24 hours a day. And what we have to remember as far as dates is that the Monday, October 5th is the last day to register to vote and Tuesday, October 6th is the day that in-person voting can actually happen out at Ledbetter Road. Again, all this information is on the Board of Elections website. So first thing is to get your, first thing is to get registered to vote. If you're not already, you have till October 5th to do that. And then Tuesday, October 6th, you can, uh, they, they will begin to mail out general election ballots and so forth. We have lots of opportunities to vote beginning October 6th. Um, we have three weeks of voting at the Ledbetter in-person early voting station, October 19th through, through the 23rd. That's three weeks before the general election from eight in the morning until six in the afternoon. And there's also weekend hours on Saturday and Sunday. And then we have from October 26th to October 30th, again, as we inch closer, eight in the morning to 7 p.m. each day of the week, Monday through Friday. And again, from Saturday the 31st, Sunday the 1st, and the week of election day, eight until two on Monday, November 2nd. And that's if you want to vote early. And of course, the general election day itself is November 3rd for various reasons people have for either going or not going or going trying to go early or to submit an absentee ballot, that's up for you to decide. You can decide on what you're safe with. Point is there's lots of opportunity. Please take advantage of it. Be like our suffragette sisters and please use your right to vote. It's gonna be very important regardless of where you are on the political spectrum. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Mayor. All right, back to you, Brian. Thank you, Josue. And uh, Mayor Pam, I really appreciate uh, you highlighting the importance of voting now more than ever. Uh, and not to mention that um, I, I do wanna highlight that there are a variety of folks in our community that are looking at ways to help make sure that everyone's vote is counted. Uh, look forward to more information about that. And it kind of ties into what I want to talk about tonight. Um, and uh, I, I guess I want to begin by apologizing for anyone that was on social media watching this live and uh, was subjected to uh, some hate speech uh, from some folks that, that hacked this meeting. It really underscores uh, the importance of what the Village of Yellow Springs did on June 15th of this year. I believe we were the first municipality in Ohio to pass a resolution declaring racism is a public health crisis. And 
Many of you know that uh, uh, Governor DeWine has recognized this on the state level. I know that public health, uh, county public health organizations are looking at this. Uh, unfortunately, we recently had an issue where many Green County elected officials have tried to stop this recognition um, on the regional level through our Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission, which is our metropolitan planning organization. Um, but the reality is we need to recognize that racism is a disease. And during this COVID crisis, it has become very apparent given the disproportional impact on uh, people of color and our minority communities in terms of housing insecurity, access to healthcare, transportation issues are involved. There are a variety of things that have really underscored and, and highlighted that we need to address this public health crisis uh, head on, and that is what the village is doing. So I wanted to highlight that uh, for those of you that don't know, um, we are committed to uh, convening what is now formally the Justice System Col a Collaborative Committee. And that committee is meeting the Tuesdays before every council meeting to talk about ways that we can address systemic racism. Um, and while there are many areas that we need to look at in terms of the justice system and public safety, we also are recognizing that this insidious disease comes up in so many different ways. And that's why I've referenced housing, transportation, healthcare, jobs. I mean, there are many things that this committee uh, is, is looking at. So these are public meetings. All council members are able to participate. Uh, we have a, uh, a great collaboration with council, the community, and our village administration. So that includes our village manager, Josue Salmaran. That includes uh, Mayor Pam Canine, uh, Chief Brian Carlson. And we have a lot of other folks. Um, our our uh, young demonstrators have been involved. And this is going to really move forward meaningful anti-racist action. Um, and, and it's not gonna be stopped. And so while we realize that there's a lot of work to be done and, uh, and there are a lot of uh, obstacles ahead, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna win this and we are going to cure this disease. And, uh, and again, it's very important to talk about it in these town hall meetings because the things that we're addressing now, such as the uh, pay and stay ordinance that was passed uh, a month and a half ago, to help with, uh, with uh, evictions and some of the impacts of that is just one of many things that we're doing. Uh, some of you may know that we recently uh, did a first reading, this was this past Monday, to decriminalize uh, some of the um, um, activities that have often pulled people into the system and allowed for that institutional racism to have an impact uh, in a way that we don't want to. Um, so we're looking at a lot of things that, that we can do to really change that trajectory. So more to come, but the next meeting of the Justice System uh, Collaborative Committee is on September 1st. That's from 3 to 4 p.m. And then you can basically expect every other Tuesday that group will be meeting and you're going to see a lot of things happening. And, and I'm really excited about the fact that even though we're a small community, we can make a huge difference and be a model to other communities and, and we're seeing the results already. So stay safe, be kind, take deep breaths and uh, don't let all the stress that's going on right now overwhelm you because we're seeing a clear path to, uh, to a better world and, um, and our community is staying safe and, uh, and that's what all the people here tonight are, are talking about. So take care. And Josue, I'll let you uh, close things out. Thank you so much, Brian, for your kind message and words of wisdom and getting us where we are now. I think we just got hacked. And we, I don't know if they knew you were talking about this, but it highlights how pervasive the disease of racism is um, in communities all over the world. 
lot in the U.S. Um, and here in the county and the state. So thank you for what you're doing and bringing us together and uh, move forward. With that, uh, we'll open up the uh, questions on town hall. I don't think I see Philip here. We've, we've closed everyone out except the speakers. Um, so I'll look through the chat boxes to see what questions have come in. All right. Okay, I see a question from Eric, Eric Clark. Um, question, what would it take to get a no engine brake sign at the entrances of the village at night? More semi trucks are using them as they approach the library. Eric, I'm wondering if you were in somehow in a meeting I had recently with the uh, county engineer, Chris Mutcher, Johnny Burns, Tommy from ODOT, and a few other folks, because we talked, one of the things we talked about was this very issue. We we're talking about um, better uh, signage on the highways, um, and we're particularly focused on heavy trucks coming through the village, because that's been a, a source of complaint in the, in the village that um, me heavy, heavy trucks, uh, semi trucks um, carrying large uh, cargo are traveling through, through very small streets in our community. A, an issue we also saw were the engine brakes. So we talked with, with we discussed the matter with the county engineer and the, the township leadership. And what we would need, what we need to do on our end is pass an ordinance that will prohibit engine brakes in our municipality. So, um, Brian is here. Brian, you're getting a first view of this. One of the recommendations we'll, we'll bring in the near future is an ordinance, an ordinance to uh, restrict ban uh, engine brakes. It's an issue we're seeing on both sides of 68 as engines, uh, sorry, as big heavy trucks are approaching our, our village. One of the challenges is that they go from a a, a state highway of 50, sorry, a highway of 55 miles per hour down to 35, and they don't have enough notice, enough distance to reduce their speed, so they kick in that engine brake to slow down that vehicle. Um, so we're seeing it on both sides of uh, 68. So, um, Brian, uh, one thing we'll be bringing to council. So, okay, let's see, any additional questions? Um, Philip, any questions? Okay, Brian, do you see any questions? Okay, well, uh, we're good. I think with this, we'll uh, end our town hall for tonight, Wednesday, August 19th. Thank you for joining us. And again, as Colin mentioned, we're here to help. Call us if you need anything. So, Ben, be well. Have a wonderful night. Thank you.